G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. We are six or seven days into the trade period. There is just one to go, one final deadline day to go. And thankfully, we've got some deals done. I say thankfully loosely as a West Coast fan. It was a very dramatic day. Last night for me, I'm based in the UK and that was where the Twitter story really broke of the deal between West Coast and Carlton for pick three. Uh, and then I woke up this morning to the news that Dan Houston has got done. So we are going to go through all of that as well as a few news stories that have popped up. Feeling a little sleepy today. I sat up way too late on Twitter, um, just taking in the absolute dramatic scenes that were happening in this year's trade period. It's just, I cannot wait to get into it. <laughs> by the way, I set an a really audacious goal actually of trying to hit 32,000 subscribers by the trade deadline day. And thank you to everyone who's jumped on. We are now within 40 of that goal. So if there's anyone who wants to see trade and draft content and footy content all year round, I'd really appreciate it if you help me get to my goal of 32,000 subscribers by hitting subscribe. All right, we're gonna start with the Dan Houston deal because that was a very sizable trade. Probably the biggest deal you're gonna see in this year's trade period. In terms of how many moving parts there are, that got done today. So yesterday I made a video about how the deal got rejected. Um, Port Adelaide obviously blinked. I think the board vetoed the decision at the last minute. That was the way it was reported. And then seemingly out of nowhere, Port Adelaide have, um, with the addition of a couple of extra picks here, or maybe just one pick, been able to approve this deal, uh, which is curious. So I'll get it up on the screen here and we can go through it. So Port Adelaide eventually give up Dan Houston and they get 39.58 and a future first. They receive Jack Lacocious, Richards, Atkins, 13, 29, 36, and 50. So what are the ways you can break this up? Well, you could say that maybe Joe Richards for 39 is one part of this breakdown. Rory Atkins for 58. Rory Atkins was a curious one. Um, you know, he played three games last year. For him to be able to come in as a important piece of this deal to ultimately get Port Adelaide to say yes, it has shades of West Coast and Matthew Owies, but we'll park that for a minute. I do think that's a little bit odd considering Port Adelaide are also absorbing a bit of the contract there, if not all of it, as far as I can tell. But there you go, Atkins for 58, Richards for 39, 13 and their future first basically swaps places. So you could say that 13 in this year's draft is probably slightly better, but it's not too much meaningfully happening there. So then we're left with Dan Houston for Jack Lacocious, Picks 29, 36, and 50. I mean, there's a few different ways you could split this trade up, but it's not an amazing deal for Port Adelaide, and I am surprised that the, um, they were able to approve this. I can't imagine what their motivations were other than just simply wanting to appease Dan Houston and or Collingwood. It seemed like Collingwood had all their cards on the table yesterday and offered just about everything they could have. It was rejected, I thought rightfully so, and nonetheless, Collingwood get what they want and Port Adelaide don't. Now look, I'm not going to tear them to shreds because the next topic we're going to talk about is my own football club, the West Coast Eagles. Um, however, this is a bit of an eyebrow raiser. If there's anything that can save this, first of all, I think Joe Richards is a decent talent, but again, probably not worth much in a trade sense. So you, you do sort of look at it two different ways. Same thing with Jack Lacocious, but I do think Jack Lacocious is a very good footballer and has the potential to be that for Port Adelaide. So longer term, there's a chance this works out for them, but it still seems like an odd move to me for them to get rid of Dan Houston to make this deal happen. Uh, as for Collingwood, Dan Houston and 58, they gave up Noble, Joe Richards, 2025 first round and pick 36. So again, they, they gave up pretty much everything that they realistically could have. They have no first rounder this year and they land a dual all Australian that's uh, heavily contracted as well. It's, it's curious, but you have to say, well done, Collingwood. Somehow you've got this deal done. Gold Coast did fairly well, I would say, in this deal. So they've given up Atkins and gotten Noble, if you want to separate it that way. And they've received 39 and two future firsts from Collingwood and Port, which you'd imagine would be fairly late first rounders, um, assuming both of these clubs play finals next year. It cost them Jack Lacocious, and they moved 13, 29, and 50 on. 13 obviously wasn't going to be much value to them. This is all a bit of a points play, so that makes sense. I do think Jack Lacocious is probably one player they could have, you know, put effort into keeping, but in the end of the day, he was heavily paid, and perhaps they're just shuffling around money for a player that wasn't necessarily 100% required. But the eyebrow raiser in here for me is Rory Atkins. I realized that Port Adelaide probably wanted a small forward. They certainly wanted a tall forward, and they probably wanted some outside run, which I'd imagine that's what Rory Atkins is as part of this, but... It does seem like a very interesting steak knife to get this deal over the line, but I'd imagine Port Adelaide fans aren't super stoked with this. Um, Dan Houston probably should have been held to his contract or traded to North Melbourne to get a better result here. I don't know how much harder that would have made getting Jack Lacocious done, but nonetheless, that is the deal done. Collingwood get a great player here. I do think losing Noble and Richards will have some impact, you know, on depth, but 
the end of the day, the, the best 22 just got a lot stronger. All right, let's move to Carlton West Coast and Richmond. Boy, oh boy, what a bombshell trade this was. You know, I've, um, I, I don't go on Twitter much. Like I just find it a fairly toxic place and I couldn't help myself this time. Um, you know, that's, that's how I've been keeping up with a lot of trade deals as they happen. And uh, I have never in my entire time of supporting West Coast seen this amount of rage or outrage from both West Coast fans and opposition fans. I mean, even, even Carlton fans are laughing about it. And fair enough, that's fair. So Carlton have gotten pick three by giving up 12, 14, and always. One little thing that made me kind of laugh is that not only were West Coast, you know, widely considered to be getting shafted, or I mean, it's self-inflicted. They've shafted themselves here. But that was already the, the opinion, the consensus, when it was 12 and 14 and always for three. But I just love how West Coast have given up 63 and 68 and gone back to 73. I realize maybe to them there's not much of a difference there, but we gave up two picks for one later one as though we weren't giving enough back already. Now, West Coast obviously have a very, very interesting take on this year's draft. I don't think they think it's worthwhile, nor do they think it's deep. I presume that's the only way I can justify this ridiculous trade. And Carlton probably need the points for the Camprioli. So West Coast have just done Carlton a favor there and apparently don't think they need to hit the draft this year. Richmond get pick 14 for Liam Baker. That's a fairly good deal, I would say. Um, considering the variety of options that were proposed, I didn't think he was ever going to go to Fremantle, and I was right when I said that. But that's pretty bang on value, and for an uncontracted player, to, for you to get value out of that, you know, Richmond will be happy. Um, Carlton will be happy. On Carlton, though, uh, while I am going to slaughter West Coast, and I, I do have an Eagles channel as well, True Eagle, I'll leave a link to that in the top right corner where I'll give my more unfiltered thoughts about West Coast, I suppose, here. Um, Carlton have, you know, achieved their goal of getting a top three pick, and I'm not going to criticize that. And they have definitely somehow pulled a fast one over West Coast here by getting 12, 14, and always to be agreed to. But let's not forget that 12, 14 is also supplemented by a future second that they gave to Hawthorne. So they have paid a reasonable price for this pick three. Now, I know that West Coast shouldn't have accepted that deal, but 12, 14, and a future second, and Matt always, it's not as though they got an absolute bargain. They did have to do two separate deals to make this happen. So I'm sure they're soaked with a pick that could potentially come Finn O'Sullivan. And uh, as a West Coast fan, I wish we still had that pick. But it is a bold and aggressive set of trades here for Carlton to get into the top three. And there may be some risk with that. Other than that, well, we didn't see deals done. I will get into some new potential trades that we've saw pop up today. But uh, on Barrish to the Hawks, as I understand it, the Hawks have offered a future first and a future second uh, in recent days, but want the Eagles' future third back. We, we already know this. However, it's come out in the last day or two that West Coast has always wanted two first round picks for Tom Barris. So that is where it currently stands. You'd imagine this one goes right to the end. I still think he gets to Hawthorne, but I am not going to say with any confidence that West Coast is going to get what they want here, given they've just done what they've done and seemingly are happy about it. Again, I will go into more depth on my True Eagle channel trying to ascertain what West Coast strategy is here. And I have a couple of thoughts, and actually I'll say one of them here. I'm not going to defend the Eagles trade with Carlton here because um, I am outraged as much as anyone else. But if I had to try and get into the thinking of West Coast here, the only way I can is that perhaps they knew that prior to them dealing with Carlton, Hawthorne knew that West Coast would need to deal with Brass first before they got Liam Baker, which takes some power away from West Coast because Hawthorne can sit back knowing West Coast would, in theory, you know, on the clock and hope that West Coast would buckle to the pressure. In this scenario, West Coast, in theory, can leave Barras to the end and they've already got Liam Baker, which in theory puts pressure on Hawthorne to get the deal done. Now, I think it's a low percentage play. I don't like it, but my guess is that's what's happening because there is some logic to that. As for Richmond's deals, well, we heard this was meant to happen yesterday with Rioli, um, six and 23 and some other picks going around. It's unclear what those are. Bolton as well. I mean, this deal, I think, has probably been agreed to a while ago. I don't really know why this is carrying on the way it is. I suppose Richmond and negotiating a multitude of deals, but it's probably one of those ones that we'll just hear about on deadline day as though they've just happened at the last minute. Same thing with Peatling. It is a joke that this has gone to the deadline. From what I can gather, the Giants and Adelaide aren't quite eye to eye on, uh, on what this value should be. So GWS have wanted a future second round pick in isolation, whereas Adelaide have put forward future seconds and future thirds 
in return for a second round back from GWS next year. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. He is out of contract, but um, Adelaide could pull a West Coast and pay full price anyway. We saw a pick swap between the Saints and the Lions today. The Brisbane Lions upgraded to 27 and St Kilda got 32 and 45. So St Kilda wanting some extra picks. Who knows whether that is going to be part of another pick swap or not, or do they like the depth of this year's draft? It seems everyone but West Coast do. Wow, I'm really not over it, am I? Harry Sharp also got done. He has ended up at the Melbourne Football Club. Melbourne get Harry Sharp in a future three. Brisbane get 49 and a future third. That's tied to Essendon. That happened today. And a couple other names with clubs pursuing them. So St Kilda is going after Brody Kemp from Carlton, who is contracted, but the Saints are going for him. I would have thought a required player at Carlton if I had to have a punt, and it's quite late for a contracted player to enter trade negotiations like this. But nonetheless, just passing that on. I suppose in a way kind of replacement for battle not quite the same player but a bit of a, a hybrid player Brody Kemp who can play on those hybrid forwards should I say and Collingwood has re-emerged for Tim Membry I say re-emerged I can't remember if this is the first time we've heard this um, but Membry still without a contract um, still no guarantee of a future at St Kilda and Collingwood um, obviously looking for some tall power even though Membry's a little undersized he's not a traditional key forward but you know there's been talk of Tomlinson Membry and Jack Hayes as well from the Saints so They've got a few fingers in different pies, so to speak. That sounded gross. A bit of an update on Sheil and Stringer. So Dylan Sheil, who had you know had been linked to GWS and St Kilda at various points, looks like he's going to stay next year. Not a big surprise, but Stringer is expected to join the Giants now. Giants offering 56. Essendon not really liking that. Again, we've never had a formal trade request here, but it seems like it's being negotiated anyway. Same thing with Caleb Daniel. He hasn't actually requested a trade, at least not publicly. It hasn't been announced, but the North and the Bulldogs still seem to be negotiating. So that's a wait and see. But other deals that we should expect to, well, get an answer on, maybe not see, but get an answer on is obviously Bailey Smith. That, um, that one's going to go right to the wire and there is some degree of risk that that one doesn't get done at all, which would leave Bailey Smith into the national draft or the preseason draft, however he chooses to proceed. Dogs still chasing Xavier O'Halloran, GWS not budging, but again, this could be one of those late deadline deal trades where they come from nowhere. Luke Park is also still at a standstill. You'd imagine Sydney will give him up to the ruse, but there's still a bit of a gap between what Sydney want to accept and what North Melbourne want to offer. So that's a bit of a wrap. Obviously, like they've left a lot of trades to the end, which is annoying. I wonder how many of these have been lodged and just not announced yet. We'll see. But either way, I'm going to do a trade uh, live stream tomorrow. Um, keep an eye out for that on the channel. We're going to stream the last like hour and a half. We'll watch along and, and chat with you guys. So if you want to be part of that, make sure you subscribe for a start and uh, make sure you check out True Footy. This time tomorrow, where we're going to uncover all the action. But for now, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Cheers.